Welcome everyone. Uh, this is EIP EIP meeting 12. Uh, we have shared the agenda in the chat and it's available on Ethereum cat herder EIP IP repo. So the first item on the agenda is onboarding EIP editors, new EIP validator and suggestions. Pooja, can you make it so I can record? Or give me permissions for that? or someone who has permissions able to record? I think it is automatically recorded and going into the cloud. It doesn't, oh, it is saying it's recording. Okay, good. Right. So once it is done, I will download and upload it to, to the Cat Hitters YouTube channel where it is all the time shared with the community. Okay. Continue, sorry for interrupting. That's all right. So uh, uh, we can start discussing about uh, uh, onboarding EIP editors. Uh, if people have thought about it, uh, like uh, what should be the criteria and if we can define some outline, like uh, if we have to uh, like invite participation from community or from the people who are actively involved with, the, uh, with submitting EIPs or creating EIPs and if they would be interested to join as an EIP editor, uh, what are the guidelines for them or maybe what would be the criteria that we can, we as a group can uh, think over it and uh, invite their participation. Thoughts on it, please? I think Ethereum involvement would be a good criteria. Yeah, actively involved in Ethereum seems. So I was thinking it if we can, you know, kind of uh, give some kind of uh, uh, numbers to that, like say for example, we are looking for EIP editors. So the primary criteria in my mind is like, they should be knowing more about EIPs. They might have submitted a few EIPs. If we can just give it a number or, you know, if they have uh, uh, shared their review on any certain EIP, so it's certain number of uh, number that we can quantify that. Might be helpful for people to, you know, share their interest and participate. Uh, a comment here, uh, I guess just understanding exactly what would be looked for. Um, are there just specifications that you'd want someone to have if they were going to be trying to, you know, edit EIPs? Like, is it a job that anyone could do that wants to take part? Or is it a job that, you know, someone would have to have certain requirements to be able to even get started? The, so talking about at least, well, Two parts, we can talk about what historically what they do, what they've done, and then we can talk about what they should do or what they could do. And the big one historic, the merging EIPs, uh, uh, merging drafts, which requires um, having the formatting done correctly and an, and an, and an understanding of GitHub so that they could do the GitHubby things. Um, something else that they do is, are trying, uh, let's see, I'm just gonna be typing these into, into the notes, uh, into the chat. So th the other thing they do is, so they merge drafts. The other one is the they determine if a PR change is errata. And what I mean by that is, let's say someone like Micah uh, finds something that's not really clearly articulated in a currently existing standard for an EIP. He makes a PR saying this better describes what the real, what the EIP was saying. Um, the EIP editor will need to be able to tell if that is a substantial change enough to, to warrant either changing the draft status, changing the status of it, or if it's really just a change in wording, then it doesn't need to go through any other process. It can just be merged, merge the change without changing the status. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I guess for me, it seems like there's probably a lot of different things for people to, to understand or learn. Like you were saying, some parts of that might be learning, understanding GitHub, how to merge things, understanding the Ethereum community and what's needed. Uh, so I guess maybe it would be helpful if there was some sort of just generalized, like, I don't want to call it a course, but some sort of learning platform where people that think that 
being a editor might be something they're interested in. Just a kind of a location to know, okay, what about GitHub would you need to know? Uh, what about, you know, the Ethereum community would you need to know just to even get started? And maybe there could be a, a way to onboard new editors where they can just be like, okay, this is where you get started. This is what you'd have to know. This is where you like, this is who you talk to kind of thing, maybe, potentially. So sometimes, oh. back, I'm sorry, please go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Trisha. So sometimes back, we talked about this mentorship program, like uh, uh, kind of uh, providing education, uh, community education uh, from community. I meant people who are interested in participating uh, for protocol improvement and, you know, kind of uh, providing checks to it, reviews to it and all. So mentorship program is a very good idea if we can uh, invite our present uh, EIP editors and uh, kind of have a session with them and document uh, the highlights from those uh, sessions as a you know, general guideline for people to understand what is actually required with this position. So the problem that we faced uh, uh, sometimes back was like uh, PRs were piling up, stacked up, and it were it were not able to be reviewed and it won't be uh, merged. So the reason why we are discussing to onboard more of the EIP editors because they they are very few in numbers and we would want to increase that. So yes, of course, I agree to the point that we should have some kind of um, uh, some place where a person can reach and see where, where they stand. I think we should start with people that are already involved in the process. They would need the least amount of education. And I think um, each current editor has either made an EIP or commented on EIP PRs. We could do a nomination system where people or already existing editors could nominate people. So that would kind of, you kind of need to be involved in Ethereum for that. I, I feel like the most difficult part is how do we nominate or how do we determine who could possibly be an editor because there's not a clear path of, because there's already people in the repository who are contributing, but it's not clear how they can go from that contributor role to editor role. And I don't think we need to be spending time to onboard those sorts of people because they're already involved. There just needs to be a clear communication of you're a contributor, this is what you do to become an editor or apply to become an editor. And then um, make it clear what the expectations for being an editor is. Sure. So then when, so people know what they're signing up for. So uh, as a group, can we uh, come up with uh, certain points like uh, uh, the expectation that we are trying to set for these people who wants to get involved and or maybe if somebody is nominating somebody, uh, other people should be able to, you know, kind of, I, I understand validation is not the right word here, but maybe, you know, kind of relate that, okay, fine, this person is fitting all the checklists. So yeah, it's a good fit for the new EIP member. What do people think about, you know, kind of defining those rules? I, um, I mean, like if we can come up with certain points, like I suggested in the beginning, like if we can, have a criteria like one person, I suppose a person who has been submitting uh, uh, PRs for adding new EIPs again and again. So say for example, if they have uh, five uh, PRs merged or maybe five EIPs, uh, existing EIPs, and they have active participation in EIP IP channel, they say that they, they are available maybe certain hours a week or something like that. Um. I think two there's there's kind of two routes to do this that could be done that both should be done, but I don't know the order of wow, some dog is very angry outside. Um expectations of an EIP editor or like requirements, something that should be written. I don't know if it goes into EIP one or into some some uh draft EIP. It just talks about what an editor uh things like what an editor does, the expectations for an editor. It could even be good to say this many hours a week is kind of a good, a good 
a, like a target of we want editors to be able to spend this amount of time a week on on doing it on doing things and still be able to participate like is the role of an editor a five hour a week job or do we think of it as a two hour a week they should be able to spend two hours a week and be uh, able to get all that needs to be done between them I think a, a way to do that is to ask existing editors i don't think any of them are on the call but axic has been here uh um and Hudson great. has been here. James, are are you an editor or are you just a coordinator? I'm not an editor. I yeah. I was asked to be earlier, and I felt in the position of hard for coordinator. It was a little bit weird to be doing both of those things, but uh, it's been a while since I thought about it. Yeah, so we could ask maybe. Um, Axic or Greg or any of the other editors for input on what they do and what they what the what from their opinion is good as um, requirements. Also, uh, who would be qualified to do what they're currently doing? Yeah, I think it's a good start. Could you do yeah. one, a survey like that you did? Yeah, yeah, we can make a survey. Um, So the hard part I think here is uh, this role is a volunteer role. So people who are actively involved and do care about uh, this uh, uh, network to run safely and you know getting improvement uh, time to time, they mostly have to be uh, you know volunteered and uh, so yeah I mean like uh, uh, I mean, I, uh, today I brought up this topic because we received some interest from the EIPIP Gitter channel. Uh, um, somebody has expressed interest and I have seen Micah. him. Yeah, right. So I have seen him active quite a, quite a few times. He has come up with a lot of uh, PRs for EIPs. And, and I was wondering how, I mean, who and how can answer his question if he is or he can be and what would be the process if he is selected like these are the basic questions that we might want to find answer and then we can uh, document these things, making it available for people because it's the information is very limited at this point of time. Previously, there hasn't been a new one for a long time. And I know this somewhat anecdotally, but I feel I can represent it well enough for what Hudson had told me that they, that um, after doing some work in the EIP repositories and PRs, someone asked to be an editor and then the editors, the current editors sat down and thought about it and approved the request through the request and just made the person an editor. Yeah, Greg admitted or posted that he supports Micah being a new editor. Yeah, the last is in 2018, which is a little bit of a different world of Ethereum. So the big ones is actively participate and comment on PRs in the EIP repository. Because if you're actively doing that, it's and helping helping process or review PRs. Even if you're not an editor, you can still review a PR and show what needs to be done for it to be merged and things like that. And uh, the other thing, I've, um, Matt, we, we put on the agenda last time, the idea of having a smaller, like a group of less permissions that can do certain things. Yeah, there's a type of contributor that you can add on GitHub, which is just for triaging issues. And I think that that would be really helpful. There's people who are interested and getting started going down that path of maybe becoming an EIP editor in the future. But it kind of gets annoying to just ping the Gitter channel constantly. If you reviewed something and you think it's good and you think that it's time for it to be merged by an EIP editor, I mm -hmm. think that if we let people uh, have this triage permissions, they can just add labels onto pull requests. So an editor can come in and pretty quickly see what's ready, what should be ready to be merged 
maybe something that's been abandoned that they could close or something like that. Something that requires like write permissions to the repository. I don't really see a harm of adding some people there and then just having a little bit tighter feedback loop. So if they're adding labels that don't make any sense, then they can be removed very quickly and they're not doing really any harm to the repository itself. Yeah. And um, how do we turn said thing on? I think it's pretty straightforward. If you go to the GitHub organization settings and then you add someone or maybe the repository settings and you add someone as a contributor or as a triage contributor. If someone has permissions to do that, I could probably walk them through it. Okay. I, I know Hudson would have it, so we can talk with him later. I like, I like, I would propose that we, anyone who wants to become a triager can just say, hey, I want to be a triager, and then we just make them it. And if there's an issue with how they triage, then we, we figure out how to address or remove, like a process for removing ones that aren't being active or things like that. It, it'd be easy to just say, hey, yeah, you can do this to anyone who asks. And then think of ways to weed that out if they're not being helpful. Does that sure. kind of make and sense? If, yeah, and if they're consistently helpful, then I think that makes them a pretty good, um, a pretty good potential EIP editor. Definitely, because you'll see that you'll they'll see that and be actively commenting in PRs, and between that. I think you just the the current EIP editors would be able to make a decision if one they need more EIP editors and then if if the person who's interested fits and then it can be a mixture of if they want to nominate if the EIP editors want to nominate people or if people want to apply we, I think we should allow both to be happening and maximize them on the number of people helping Agree. Any more thought on uh, the topic number one? My understanding is that we would be conducting a survey to collect some feedback from the EIP editors to uh, uh, kind of uh, collect the criteria that we would be documenting uh, as an expectation for people who are interested or is being nominated to be an EIP editor. And the, uh, the triage thing for uh, sorting out the issues is also very helpful, but I'm not very clear about the, uh, you know, uh, the permissions that who can give that or how it can be done. So it's anybody who has control of the Ethereum organization or of the EIP repository. Uh, got it. And the Ethereum foundation has over the EIP repository has, has oh, the whole organization is the is Ethereum Foundation. And then the EIPs is pretty much the editors. Got it. So in that case, anyone who is, uh, in, uh, you know, currently associated with Ethereum Foundation directly, uh, they can, if they would want to opt for that, they can do that. And it would be good to have a list uh, kept somewhere for uh, reference for other people. Mm, sort sort of. I, I wouldn't say anyone at the Ethereum Foundation could do it. There's probably a small group of people that would be able to add, add things to the EIP, add owners to the EIP repository, including the EIP editors are able to do that. Uh, but I, um, it's add a task to me to follow up on how to add to give people permissions for being a triager. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, so I, I can follow up on that and possibly I could get the permissions to be allowed to do that. Yes, sir. And we can start that as a good first step. Right, we, we would note it down for the, uh, action items uh, 
against him. Mm -hmm. And then Edson, if you could work on a on a a quick survey that we can send to the editors, that includes things like how uh, how much time would you do you spend being in doing editor work? How much time do you think the role should take? And things like uh, what's experience or or uh, we can brainstorm questions for a little bit if that'd be helpful. Yeah, what might be some a good criteria to indicate someone is qualified for that? Yeah, that's a good question for the editors. All right. So do we have any more question comments on this topic before we move on to the next one? Uh, I've got one other question. You know, we've, we've talked about talking, building some criteria for what it means to be an editor and then what kind of work we expect the editor to do. But if they're not meeting those expectations to become an editor, we haven't really talked about what happens to them. Is the editor list an append only list or is it something that with enough feedback people can be removed from? The, is Offrey still an editor? Does it say that on EIP1? Or did he remove himself? Uh, who, I'm sorry, can you? I don't, I don't think he's on there anymore. Uh, Offrey was, was an editor, I believe. No, he's not anymore. So you see, I think, but I think he removed himself because of the community fiasco that happened uh, earlier. But there, I do think we need to think of something like that. And the best suggestion I've thought of would be to make it based on activity. So if you're not active for a certain amount of time, uh, merging PRs basically, that you just automatically get removed. Or you're at least uh, uh, can be removed. Or you're, you're like flagged for removal if you haven't done anything for say six months. Right, we can add that as a criteria, you know, when expectations, we are setting up expectations, we can mention that as one of the criteria as well. And I have seen like the history of it, like um, uh, Yoichi was also one of the EIP editors when he was with Ethereum, he was very active, but after he left, he is also removed from the editors list. So it can be kept up to date depending upon like who are still present and active. Yeah, I'd say a mechanism for one to that just passively removes editors that aren't contributing. So there, so there's an easy way to say if someone's moved on to another project or if they've they're really not doing Ethereum things or actively in the Ethereum developer space that probably doesn't make sense for them to be an editor. But going through the politics of having or uh, and the drama of having to figure out how to remove that person is kind of a lot. So it, and so one having a pro, having some kind of activity threshold of if you're this active do and it could be very low and um, then you're and then have a second process for if EIP editors feel like someone is misbehaving this hasn't really happened for us but it definitely happened for the for the uh, Ethereum Classic community which was a really interesting case study about what to do, have EIP editors have a process for removing someone who's inappropriately using their editor capabilities. I think, um, say someone's doing something unethical, I think it could be moved to a majority vote of the current editors. If we just assume the majority will behave altruistically. Yeah, even super majority might be fine, but so, some process like some, the two processes are those kind of things that with two mechanisms for doing that, I think the, the list will be, will be maintained pretty high quality. So right, like we have a good uh, uh, first step here, uh, conducting a survey from the IP editors trying to uh, get some requirement and expectations set for future EIP editors. 
uh, including the process of uh, onboarding them as well as at times when it is required that they should be removed from the list. Uh, we should be enlisting all those criteria. So we are almost halfway of the meeting. So I think we should time box this and move on to the next uh, item. Um, I'd, I'd like to just ask Matt one more question on, was there things you were thinking about specifically in that for a process for removing or having this shrink or shrinking editor list? I mean, my general thoughts right now is that we're trying to scale a EIP editor list of like eight to maybe teens or 20 tops. So I don't think that too much process is needed. It's maybe a majority or super majority would be fine depending on, I don't know how often the EIP editors meet. Maybe that might be something to add as a responsibility of the IP editors to have a quarterly meeting and discuss things like that. Are people pulling their weight or not? I don't know. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Should We should add that. That'd be something I'd be happy to host. Yeah, so attendance to the meetings is actually a good requirement. All right. One, one last thing on this, if you guys have any thoughts on things that need to be added as requirements to EIPs or things that the validator should check, if you could just message that to me directly or add that as an issue on the EIP validator. I'm trying to create a list of things that need to be implemented. I have a document that I wrote out a few of them. Do you know where uh, that is, Pooja? Uh, I think it's in to-dos. Maybe it's linked there. Let me show. On the notes for a previous meeting? Oh, uh, no, on the agenda. Today's agenda item number three. So. Oh, yeah. Uh, just, uh, I'm sorry, you can go ahead. I just put it in the, in the, the notes, Matt, but let's make a meeting, let's schedule something to go over that because I, I, I think that'd be a good call to have. Okay. Uh, one last comment. Um, so I was thinking about this when I write, wrote the article for the roadmap. Um, say, because we're currently still editing the process and the EAPs itself. Um, if we were to onboard people now, they would be learning the old process and would have to learn the new process very quickly. So they'd be doing one thing and then doing another. It might be better to wait until the new process is fleshed out and matured before we have people learn how to become an editor and be onboarded was my first thought. Yeah, that's a good point. I think this will take some time to shape up properly. So by the time we are into the new process, this thing should be ready parallelly. I, I am hoping that it would be ready parallelly and would not be a problem for EIP editors. Moreover, the people that we are trying to consider here as an editor are actively involved. So it would be a good transition for them also to learn about both the processes. I mean, that's just my thought. Yeah, uh, Micah, for example, would be totally fine yeah. being able to handle that. Uh, Matt would be totally fine being able to handle that. The 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 uh, those new statuses, I think, are getting pretty solid, and those are the I think the biggest ones. But it, yeah, it would be good to have some of that be settled before we're really pushing this. That's a good point. So thanks for bringing that up, Edson. So moving on, the next uh, item is the separation of EIP process and the hard fork coordination. We did uh, uh, some progress in previous meetings about separating it, like we are now having clarity on the EIP process as well as the statuses that we should be referring 
in the new process. Um, uh, James, would you like to take it over and let us know about how we would like to uh, take care of hard fork coordination and how would we want to set it as a separate process? Yeah, so the first step of separating it would be making the new, uh, like officially accepting into EIP1 the new statuses and the transitions between them. Um, and then a lot of work on the EIP repository, changing those, changing the statuses for the EIPs that currently exist. For updates on the hard for coordination prog process, we, on the all core dev side, there's, we've taken a hiatus from talking about Berlin or from working on Berlin and then focused on working on uh, client diversity and handling some of the pressures on client developers and what are strategies we can do to help prevent, uh, avoid burnout and just put client developers in a better mind space, especially ones that have majority client share. And so the process that we've gotten to so far is to have things get into the eligible for inclusion and that gets applied uh, that is done on the Oracle dev calls and people apply their eips and then they're discussed and then through rough consensus they get moved into that bucket and then the next stage we've talked about is having them be implemented into some kind of yolo test net which means that all the clients have to build a some implementation of it doesn't mean that it's finalized. It doesn't mean it's in the state that'll go into mainnet, but it's at least in the state where they want to see what it's like to run the EIP in a, some, in a real world sort of setting and, and on the test net. And then that we're, I'm kind of waiting to see what happens next because I don't want to prescribe the process. I want to let the process evolve and to, uh, Emer have a lot of emergent properties that showed up. And so progress on what happens next after that, I think we'll resume when we restart talking about Berlin. But then recording those steps and then defining them a little bit better is the, the process for, like the first couple steps that have been more fleshed out need to be documented well and decided if they go into EIP one or if they go into a separate EIP. And that's the update for the status of those two and next steps for both of them. Uh, is there any qu questions or things about that? I read a lot, a lot, a lot of information there. I have a uh, one question or maybe concern. So the present EIP one, it talks about EIP process that includes both the, both the EIP process as well as the hard fork process because it's uh, one, uh, it's merged together. So if, uh, if say for example, in future, we would like to you know, kind of update the EIP one with the separation of this process, uh, what do you think about documenting it in the way of like two separate process, we define it clearly and then do it the way uh, we have seen it for EIP process. Like I found it quite effective and very easy for people to grasp it like in a pictorial representation. So how do you feel about having this thing uh, laid out for hard work coordination as well? And when we are ready with those plus the status, uh, 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 the term for the status, and then we go ahead and update it to EIP one. Uh, are you are you saying to update EIP one with the hard fork coordinate the new hard fork coordination rules, and at the same time that you do the the status updates? Yes, I, I was wondering like if we do all these if we bring all these three three things together and then go ahead and update EIP one, it would add uh, you know uh, clarity to people to understand to relate you know. Otherwise, I'm, I'm worried that people may go blank. Okay, fine. This is the EIP process. I get that part. And these are the terms that is specified for EIP statuses. But what about hard work? Because it is missing. It is. It was earlier, but now it is missing. So just suggesting that if we can get all these three things together and then push it. Um, 
It, I don't yet know if the preference is for it to be in EIP one or to have its own EIP. The, I mean, the hard floor coordination side or the network upgrade path uh, pipeline and the way of tracking it. I, one is it's not totally finished. So waiting, I wouldn't want to wait to add the statuses, to update the standardization process and statuses. I wouldn't want to wait for the network upgrade process to be fully specified because that will take an unknown, uh, uh, unknown amount of time. Okay, so if you're not very sure about like if both have to be, because I was thinking of a, docu a place to be documented and at, at this time we, we can see EIP one as the place of documentation of every process is related to EIP. But if we are considering uh, the hard fork process to be network document, network upgrade process into some other separate documents, I think uh, I, I clearly understand what you mean by going ahead with the statuses. I think there's nothing wrong in opening a new EAP for those, uh, seeing as you can link to it in EIP one, it doesn't have to be included directly. I mean, it doesn't have to be excluded entirely. Yeah, that's a good point. And we do have a project board that, uh, for EIP IPs. So that's a good thing to also link to in the EIP. So yeah, I, I, that makes sense. Um, anyone else have thoughts about if it should go in EIP one or start as an, as its own EIP and then figure out what happens after that. So we're talking about, um, the hard for coordination process, right? Yes. Well, my initial thought is like, we should have both of them at EIP one, but if people have a uh, like, um, strong recommendation of keeping it separate at the network upgrade process separately. And uh, I think that can be referred in EIP one. I'm, I'm fine either way, so no reservations. I kind of find it a little strange that EIP one has this special status that allows us to continually update it over time. So I mean, I think my preference is generally to keep an EIP static once it's accepted, and then if there are substantial changes, add new EIPs. But we've already kind of passed that precedent, so maybe it's okay for us to continue. Yeah, that's. It's pretty at least helpful for the EIP IP process and um, yeah, the EIP one has that status for the for the EIP uh, not the EIP IP the EFI list having that be something that's updatable without needing to make changes to the numbering makes a lot of sense like because it's being as a registry. Um, I guess like why why would we want to have a list of EIPs that are eligible for inclusion? Um, why can we not generate this based on their statuses? Like why do we need to have an EIP that's updated as a tracker? I feel like this is something that could be built on top of the list of EIPs. Mm -hmm. So if if it was through statuses, then we're we're connecting again the network upgrade process and an EIP standardization process. So the, have you seen the new list of EIP statuses? I don't think so, no. But I think that we might need connected at some point of time. So uh, I, I, I find this uh, suggestion quite useful. Like we, we would be looking for some kind of connector between these two processes since we decided to separate it. So EFI is maybe a good one. Just yeah, and the, 
so for, from just the way we've done it so far, it's been helpful because it comes, someone comes to a meeting and says, I want this EIP to be EFI. And then we change, then we add it to the list of current EFI EIPs. And that process has been, has worked pretty smoothly. Uh, making a, the, the stat, if the statuses include information about its in, inclusion on in a hard fork or onto mainnet then we start connecting the worlds again that we're trying to separate so what's the status in eip that's that's been considered as efi so um efi isn't in eip status it's a status was, for um hard fork nation which what, uh, is in a process for each eip so EFI is only applicable to core EIPs who are into consideration for hard work. But the so, EIPs that have been decided that it could be possibly included a hard work, can they, can it draft the EFI or does, does it need to be at an accepted point? Uh, drafts it's, usually, it's from usually, my understanding. It, but it could be any, it could really be any stage. If something was, in a final standard stage and then they wanted to bring it to EFI, they totally could. So there isn't a one status that is a requirement to be on. Okay. So what we're trying to do is externalize the decision making. So it's not part of like drafting EIPs itself, um, what EIPs are included. So the EIP repos to have uh, t uh, options for inclusion into hard fork. That's, um, separate from any political or controversial um just any any political position uh just to have it exist and be formalized and then the hard fork connection process can deal with the decision making on whether any ip should be implemented not really like what or how it is so what is the argument against having, we can come up with whatever name, but a status that says EFI, which basically is just denoting that it's in a pretty stable place. So people think it could be included in a hard fork at some point, but it's not on the network yet. So one thing was um, EFI was only applicable to a few EIPs. Um, it wouldn't be applicable to ERCs, for example. So we'd be creating a status. So like the new statuses right now are uh, applied to every single EIP. Um, if we were to create a unique status, um, it would it would basically it, it wouldn't apply to every single EIP. It would create confusion and increase complexity of the current statuses. And a another a, a example of where it would show where it would have shown up historically is ProgPow could have been put into a final stage as in this is what the proposal is, but not, so it could be final as far as the standard, but it doesn't need to be marked as being in eligible for inclusion. So, so, so final in the new statuses does not mean it's been implemented in a hard fork. No, it means it's the standard is, is that the state of the art, this is the proposal, and any changes to it that aren't, that are beyond fixing typos and making things clear should be done as a new EIP. So like, for example, like in just like political systems, you have a process for drafting bills and then you have a separate process for um, including them into law, if that makes sense. Let me share, let me share my screen and I can. Oh, can you make it so I can share my screen, Pooja? Or whoever is host? Actually, I'm not sure today is any host because I logged in with Pooja. Oh, so you don't have a host. Okay. That's okay. I'll just link this here again. I have the, in the, in here, in the HackMD, I meant to send this earlier too. In the HackMD link that's in the chat, 
there, if you scroll down to EIP status definition three to version two, okay, I see. the top, uh, you'll see two diagrams. The top one is the one we've settled on. And at any of, at any point in the draft review, last call, final, stage something could move something could apply to being uh included for a hard fork and then that would be considered in some other kind of flow but this this flow works for all different eip types and that's that's nice and it it's it's clearly separated as standard the eip standardization process and not a what's going to go into mainnet or not like an, another example of where this has come up is greg's eip on static jumps i believe it's called because it's in efi but the current standard is not likely the one that'll go into mainnet and so either, but, but the proposal that Greg has could very easily go into a final stage and say, this is the, this is the proposal that Greg does. Uh, then it could be determined separately if that's the standard that, that wants to be implemented because there's a few other restrictions that the, that the core developers are considering adding uh, up like above and beyond Greg's EIP. But uh, I've, I've noticed that stuff gets kind of gets stuck on the what it will look like when it's connected to what's going to go on to mainnet, and then it bogs a lot of these things down. Yeah, I mean, it seems like you guys have thought a lot about this, so. I'll, I'll just think about it on my own a little bit and see if I have any other feedback, but generally it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, well, I, and I, I appreciate the questions and the, and the critical thinking on it. So please keep, keep them coming. If we can't adequately defend why we made decisions, then we need to re-re-rethinking them. I'm sorry about that screen sharing issue. Maybe because uh, nobody is host here, it's not allowing any of us to do that. But next time, I'll be sure to check into it before we start the meeting. Yeah. So uh, we. Uh, uh, one final comment about that. I think so. Right now, currently, the hard fork meta EIP is its own EIP separate from EIP one and. EFI tracker is its own EIP separate from EIP one. So it looks like all hard fork coordination EIPs are in their own EIP. So um, that's more another reason why I'm inclined to keep it in its own EIP, the hard fork coordination process. Are you saying that we should merge all of those different standards? Uh, so the new hard fork creation process, I think we should create its own EAP. And then when we update it, we can supersede it. Um, but for the statuses, the new statuses, I think we should make a PR for EAP one. Yeah, I think it, uh, it would make sense. I remember this conversation in one of the previous meetings that we requested that EAP one should not be updated so frequently. And this hard fork process, uh, historically, the process has changed. So it makes sense that we just add a, a link to the EIP in which this upgrade process, network upgrade process is explained and added to EIP1 instead of ha having it uh, added directly to EIP1. Any more question comments on this topic we are almost at the end of the meeting uh, I do it's in your comment on it, I think it would be good to have the 
the EIP written about, or, and maybe it was you, Pooja, but have the EIP written for the network coordination, the network upgrade process before we do the EIP-1 merge for statuses. That actually makes more sense. So the next step is actually making an EIP for documenting the, the network upgrade status as it stands. Right. Yeah, that's actually better. I'm glad we didn't do it the other way. Now thinking about it. Okay, so we can add it as an action item for now. And let's say in the next meeting, if we are done with that, then we will, I mean, then people can go ahead and create the PR for updating EIP one. Yep. Okay. So we have very few uh, minutes left. Which topic we would like to pick up clearly um, and uh, like quickly? Uh, uh, there is one emergency communication document. Uh, I am not sure, William, are you on the call or if you can? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, if you can quickly walk us through what is it about. I mean, this was discussed in the previous meeting and if you have any update on it. Okay, um, I know I'm up against time, so I'll try and keep this as brief as possible. I also was not by the last meeting, so I don't know what was discussed there, but um, the idea of trying to raise an, an emergency comms team was raised in the cat herders, so I responded to that. Um, in the meantime, what uh, Pooja's arranged are a little bit of a team. Um, what I've been working on is trying to basically assemble a document that both defines what a state of emergency is for the Ethereum protocol platform, not even exactly sure what terminology to use, and what would be done in such a case. I've also been giving a bit of thought about to how a comms team would work. This is like really, really the early stages. Um, I tried doing a bit of Twitter polling also about what people think an emergency is. As of right now, I've come up with really two, I think, sort of, sort of overarching definitions that it's either that there's something that renders the network inaccessible. The easiest example of that would be a DDoS attack or something that compromises the integrity of transactions being recorded on the network, past, present, or future. Um, those are both very general, but there's a lot of things that you can sort of um, get into both of those or either or both of those. Um, so I guess the question is basically, first of all, I'm not sure that this is an EIP IP thing. I don't know how much this is actually related to the EIP process, if we would need to draft an EIP about states of emergency or maybe what the right protocol is in the state of emergency. I'd also be interested in hearing from the EIP IP team what they would want out of an initiative like this, even if that means sort of um, broadening the scope to something else, um, and just general feedback. So uh, uh, this uh, this thing was discussed in the previous meeting, saying that uh, it, it makes sense that uh, there should be a group who would be proactive about the kind of emergency situation that may come up during network upgrade or otherwise. So uh, we picked it up from there, although I know that the uh, cat headers have already been doing it. I listed it in this agenda this time. If people would like to see it again, uh, we can bring it back. Uh, as you mentioned, that may be in the form of EIP or something else, but if not, then I'm happy to keep it off the agenda and uh, con uh, continue the discussion with the cat herders. Uh, what are the other thoughts here? Uh, I'd have to think more about it being an EIP or not, but it would fit as an informational EIP. Right, yeah. Uh, my concern here is like this emergency con things and this uh, the document and the checklist that we are talking about. Uh, I am um, a little conservative about uh, sharing it with too many people, around, right? So, I mean, this document should be with a group of people who who are actively taking responsibility of it or maybe reaching out to the stakeholders at the time of emergency. Uh, I'm not sure how public it should be because all the EIPs, even in the informational format, it is going to be quite public. So yeah. I think that there should be an avenue for the public to initiate or get in contact with those who can do more. So 
I would as long as we don't, we're not listing out all of the people in the informational EIP. Like if you're, if you document the process and maybe a few shepherds of people to contact, if you want to know more about it, who then, what, um, How I mean, in other words, the EIP should be process. A contact list wouldn't be part of an EIP, especially because that's not something that's going to be set in stone and will mutate with time. Like the actual, like what, we, what we'd be looking for in an, EI, in an EIP would be some sort of codification of process, but not the actual specific contacts. I mean, it would probably suffice to use a word like major stakeholder, major mining groups, or something like that, instead of actually providing contact information. Yeah. Yeah, it would make sense to add checklist kind of thing that people may refer at, at times when uh, such situation emerges. Uh, yeah, it makes sense to keep it in the form of that information if we are not uh, sharing more information and maybe adding some contact uh, a way to contact people who are actively involved with this group. So it sounds like this probably should be pulled off the EIP IEP agenda and then maybe at such a time that we're ready to um, to what's it called, an EIP, to submit an EIP uh, or an informational EIP. So then maybe, maybe then it would come back again as an item. Does that sound about right? Sounds good to me. Yep, I'd also ask some editors about what they think. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I recommend that, but I, everything else sounds good. We are almost time, but I want to just quickly share a couple of things here. Uh, we have created the CIP IP project board. Uh, the link is available in the agenda and uh, people can go ahead and look and uh, check it out. Uh, how does it look? I would love to have feedback and uh, um, how it's we so want good. I'm sorry. It's so good. I love it. Oh, thank you. So yeah, we would like to keep it uh, up to date. Uh, the the task that we are completing, um, we would keep it as completed and would try to link it up there so people can go back and see what all we have achieved with this group. Uh, I think that would be a good informational sharing platform to attract more people to be a part of this meeting who cares about the network security and improvement protocol in Ethereum. Uh, there was one last thing I just quickly wanted to share about uh, the, in the previous call, we, we shared uh, the Muir Glacier upgrade post-mortem, uh, but uh, the thing that we did not share was uh, the generic template. Uh, I'm sharing the link in the chat if people can give a look to it and if they have any feedback, comment, or feel free to let us know about it. And uh, I'm not sure if we have more time to discuss anything else, but if people uh, want to uh, come about something, uh, please feel free. So, yeah. Uh, Looks good to me. Okay. So the, yeah, please. Uh, I'm, it looks good to me, but I'm biased. <laughs> yeah, we worked together. <laughs> Get that far. Yeah. So yeah, we would like to have more feedback on it from people. And um, uh, maybe, uh, again, we were stuck with this point and we discussed in the cat herder that there should be, uh, you know, some kind of discussion forum for this kind of EIPs, uh, or maybe, you know, report if we would want to say it as like assessment report for any upgrade. Uh, I'm, I'm planning to open uh, a magician post about it. I haven't done it. Uh, it's a long due on my part, I'll do that. Uh, uh, might be, might yeah. be good to open a PR and then change the EAP number. Right. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. And then okay. change the file name to the EAP and then the EAP number. Yes. Yes, it makes sense. But uh, yeah, we can do that. And um, I'm also share. I have also shared the link of the previous. Uh, uh, post-mortem upgrade that we shared in the previous meeting about the new glacier. So uh, I have added the missing uh, post on the foundation. And uh, yes, uh, we are ready to share it with the uh, all core devs. 
uh, in any of the meetings, future meetings, when Berlin is back up or when we are talking about upgrades. So yeah, that's all from, uh, from the agenda that we can cover uh, today. Anything else anybody would want to share or Okay, I, I think then we are good to go uh, today. Um, thank you everyone for joining this meeting today. See you guys in uh, two weeks. Uh, the next meeting is on July 30th. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Okay, thanks everyone. Have a great day. Bye -bye.